Welcome to Mythology Matters, the podcast of all things mythological. Okay, Joseph Campbell. Most people are interested in the subject of myth. What they know is the hero's journey. And maybe they know Joseph Campbell, maybe they've watched The Power of Myth, the documentary series that was made with Bill Moyers in the 1980s. But uh, in general, just talking to people and looking at what's on the internet, uh, this is pretty much what they know. It's as far as their, their interest in the subject has gone, apart from reading various anthologies of uh, translations or retellings of myths. And the contention of this part of the episode is that there is no hero's journey. And it's one of the things that you, you first encounter when you get turned on to this subject by Campbell is you go and look for source documents. You want to read source materials. And when you encounter these stories, you immediately discover that there are a bazillion versions of each story. It stretches enormous amounts of times, sometimes millennia, and uh, vast changes in language and, and sometimes incredibly broad geographical diaspora. Uh, that is the first challenge. And the second challenge is no version that you can find matches the version that he told or matches up with his hero's journey. Now, I have not come to bury Joseph Campbell. I have come to praise Joseph Campbell. I love Joseph Campbell. He was a truly important, great, and original scholar. He, he had many sources in many antecedents. He was not working in a vacuum, and not all of the ideas that he expounded were his own. A uh, few of them were his own. But he took everything and he put it into a new paradigm and a new way of approaching this that is still exciting. His books are incredibly readable. I don't even think The Hero's Journey is the best thing that he did. It's an important book for many people. I think it's a very important book as a self-help guide. And I believe that was his intention more than to expound upon the subject of mythology as a scholar or an anthropologist. And I'll go into that, why I think that's true. But, uh, you know, I'm recommending him. Uh, I think the Masks of God, those four volumes are, those are my favorites. I think they're essential. Uh, they're really essential to getting the full picture of understanding what he was doing. But the reality remains, most people get turned on to this, the possibility that these stories have a utility in everyday life that they have a psychological dimension, uh, autobiographical dimension, that these stories have a s social significance that doesn't fade with time. Usually this comes through the hero's journey. And as most people discover once you get past it, good luck finding it anywhere. And this eventually led me to the sad conclusion that this thing does not exist. And I will go point by point and explain that. What does exist is a structure like that in terms of the average human life. And that is where the importance of the book is. And that is the style of interdisciplinary approach that Campbell made so accessible and popular and easy to engage with. So he makes it possible for you to create these one-to-one -one ratios to stories from uh, cultures and times that are remote from your own. And of course, that is the purpose these stories originally served. They were a part of social glue. They were a way of passing on tradition. It's a lot more complicated than the hero's journey. Now, how I discovered Campbell uh, is a mildly amusing story I will share with you. Uh, back in the 1980s, I was a, a kid, I was an adolescent, teenager, and uh, I was very into science fiction. 
science fiction and fantasy. And pretty much what I had was the public library and the bookstore. And there's a lot of old, and especially in the library, there's a lot of older stuff. So uh, I was able to sort of go back and work my way through from uh, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells up to the present. And there were all these anthologies, uh, you know, the Saturn Award winners and the best of Galaxy Magazine. And in that way, I became familiar with uh, the magazine era of fiction in this country. And there was an editor named John W. Campbell. You know, everything that I could put together, not only had he worked with all the greats, not had, only had he been instrumental in the creation of the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov, uh, the Dune series by Frank Herbert, and many, many others. But from what I can glean, uh, he was a really colorful character, kind of an outrageous character. And he was an early subscriber to uh, Scientology, which was just called Dianetics. He knew, he knew his stuff inside out. He was a real uh, Tolkien expert. But it was impossible to get much more information about him. And I, I, I was always thinking, oh, man, I wish there was just a book about John Campbell. I'd love to learn more about this person. He's interesting. And one day I was at the library and I saw there was like a coffee table book about John Campbell. And I just grabbed it and put it on my stack and took it home. And when I got home, boy, was I disappointed. Uh, it wasn't about John Campbell. It was about someone named Joseph Campbell. And I'm flipping through this black and white pictures of him on the track team and playing a saxophone and uh, something about some school called Sarah Lawrence. I thought, what the hell is this crap? <laughs> this is not what I wanted. There, there were, you know, there was super text, you know, large text that's taken out of the, the paragraphs and given like almost a whole page. And uh, there's one quote, this we call the Dark Sea Journey. Now, I had already been reading Carl Jung. I didn't know what to do with that. I was just intrigued by it, absorbed by it. Uh, I loved his theory of personalities, but most of it was sailing straight over my little head. I didn't really know what to, to do with it. But uh, through Jung, I was getting an idea of the utility of myth, utility of tradition. And I just, I sort of recognized that, of course, Joseph Campbell was an enormous very serious Jungian, and I, I recognized the poetry of that. And as I paged through it, I was like, oh, it's that guy. That guy, every time they have the fundraiser on PBS, they run that series. I always miss most of it. I like catch the tail end or the middle, and then they go like, they're raising money for two hours. I lose interest, and I turn on Star Trek or whatever. It's that, that guy. And I was thinking of the power of myth, which would, you know, come on randomly, and they'd repeated at midnight or you know or it would be during the fu the fundraising um <clears throat> so then i became interested and i read the book and i thought oh, i have to read his stuff and of course i got hero with a thousand faces and bzing, you know and it, it was because of uh campbell i got into james joyce because he, he talked a lot about ulysses and finnegan's wake and i read them and uh, you know my mind was on fire with all of this stuff it completely transformed the way I wrote and the way I imagined things and the way I read things. And, you know, I read through The Masks of God and I can't even remember uh, the other books. There's one, um, one about fairy tales and, uh, it, you know, I worked my way through all this and uh, I, I was still reading the same old, you know, you'd get these anthologies like Bullfinch type um, but uh, I hadn't really gotten down to it, like get get to a, a legitimate historical artifact of a document, an ancient text. And of course, the very first thing that I realized was the hero's journey was not there. You've got to close one eye, squint with the other, can't turn your head a little, maybe put your hand up and block parts of the story. And if you're very generous and uh, forgiving, you might say, yeah, there's something like that there if you want to see it that way. Uh, the other way that Campbell was very important, though, is he made a Jungian of me by explaining Jung in terms that I could understand, and he made a lifelong Jungian out of me, as opposed to someone who just read Jung and uh, never applied it or took it very seriously. So this is a very generalized overview 
I'm going to rip through it in the future. I'd like to go into more detail. In fact, I'd like to go through all four volumes of The Masks of God, which is superb and my favorite. I've reread it so many times. But uh, when, when, as you grow, as you learn more, you learn more about anthropology as a discipline, and you learn more about the collection of folklore and oral tradition, and you know, you begin and you read more sort of like peer reviewed literature. And of course, I'll, I'll explain how anthropology grew over time. You begin to see there's lots of caveats in Campbell. Uh, on the one hand, he said, I believe that it's all one story and no one can tell me any different. Uh, on the other hand, he, he's full of, you know, he, he refrains or says, well, you know, that uh, some people will disagree and these kinds of people will disagree. And if you're of a certain mind, you won't agree. And of course, we can never know and this sort of thing. And, you know, the reality is uh, he had a game. I think it was an important one useful. It's still useful. I love his game, and I think he was brilliant at what he did, but uh, he he was not a hard-nosed uh, imp empiricist. Uh, there There is, you know, he has an element of hard-nosed empiricism uh, that he allows in, <laughs> and he may, he may have been one of the first to include evolutionary theory and uh, what we call evolutionary psychology, he may have been one of the first mythographers to do this. I'm having, I can't really think of anyone before him who really brought this into the, the discipline uh, and expounding on the utility of myth. But at the same time, he was convinced of this thing which cannot be proven, the monomyth. So I'll, I will get right to that. Um, we have to talk about where, where Campbell was positioned when he took up this work which it fell under the umbrella of anthropology. So anthropology, really, as we know it, it gets started in the 19th century. It is not a very exacting science. It was an extension of kind of a ethnographic census and uh, interpretation of archaeological artifacts for gover so government plans of, of how to deal with indigenous peoples, as now you know, Spain and, and England, you know, they're spreading out across the world and you, you have the uh, the trading companies and the, you know you, we, we've been through this whole long uh, mercantile age and it's expanded the boundaries and by the 19th century some sort of policy was necessary that's really where it gets started and uh, it's not not a great science a lot of the data is now priceless it's really useful uh, much of it was not gathered for good purpose. It was gathered for what we would consider to be uh, very negative imperialistic purposes. But uh, that's that's the beginning. It was just beginning. The, the the interest wasn't, and there are exceptions to everything. There were some some ethnologists from the time who were way ahead of their time. But it wasn't so much just an interest in how other people lived, what they believed. But it was to um, for, forge policies and uh, what, do, what do we do with these people and uh, how many are there and uh, things like that. So the 19th century is also the explosion of biology as we know it. Now, I can't get into too much detail. I, I hopefully will in the future. There are many interesting intersections between biology and what we now call anthropology in the 19th century uh, from Darwin. I just have to add this, that Darwin really wanted to pioneer, you know, the kind of ethnography that we have today and gather data from the groups themselves. And he tried uh, with the descent of man and he was discouraged. He was discouraged by racists. He was not a racist. Uh, but he was discouraged by racists, and he, he, he really wasn't much of a boat rocker. You may find that hard to believe, but he wasn't. And uh, since he was pestering people for data, he, he, he was reluctant. You just have to go, just go and read his correspondence. There's thousands and thousands of pages available for free online at the Darwin Correspondence Project. Uh, or if you have access to a university library, there are printed volumes. But anyway, you can see he would send these letters out, and after a while, he'd not want to uh, lose his contact here or there in uh, Tierra del Fuego or Africa. He didn't want to uh, piss people off 
by by be, by begging them constantly to to do his uh, his his work for him. So he demurred, but uh, there you see little sparks of what we would call anthropology now. It wasn't really happening, even though it was intersecting. Biology, though, was exploding. And if you go back, and I just reread over the winter, I reread a mountain of uh, biological texts from the 19th century. Darwin and all of his associates, even some of his enemies. Um, it, and I'm just going to say in brief, it was extraordinary. Biology was, in an unbel you can't believe the amount of data these people collected and how many important ideas came out of the middle to the end of the 19th century. It, it, re it really uh, it shot out into the 20th century as if from a cannon, and then the cannon just crashed. By the time you get to the 1920s after World War I, you know, looking at it now, biology, it was like barely a science. It just degraded very fast. And you know, part of, part of the, the problem did have to do with, with things that, you know, we call racism now and sexism and all the rest of it. I mean, these were realities wherever you are uh, on, the, on the polls uh, politically. I'm nowhere, and I'll get into that later. Uh, I'm not trying to stir the pot here, but it was a reality and it retarded the science. By, by 1915, I would say, you, you read this stuff and it's, it's, it's almost divorced from the incredible work that was done just one generation earlier. But then, you know, you get to Einstein. I am a math tard. <laughs> Physics ain't my thing. I'm not gonna get you know. I understand it basically. I get the. I get it. The the revolution in mathematics really set the tone for the 20th century as far as science was concerned. And through Einstein, it be, became possible to hypothesize a universal theory that would bind the whole science together. Uh, it would have you know unlimited explanatory power. And you know biology wanted to catch up. And really, it was the it was the lack of a, a mechanism for heredity that was whole that that was the the technical issue that was retarding biology. And what came was what's called the first synthesis. It's Darwinian natural selection and Mendelian genetics, and we get the the beginnings, the real beginnings of biology, uh, the science as we know it now. Uh, so now that in biology, it was possible to hypothesize a grand unifying theory that would pull the whole science together and have unlimited explanatory power and, you know, trailing behind were the social sciences, uh, which I suppose include cultural anthropology. Uh, and, you know, there were big blunders. You know, there was the hoax of the Piltdown Man and, and there was you know, social Darwinism. And I mean, they, they, it, it was just like. I mean, it was a real crap show. Uh, you do now start to have the emergence of, of field anthropologists who are collecting data from indigenous peoples and not interpreting it through a European lens. And, you know, this is all important stuff for gathering unbiased data. Uh, you need it. But uh, it, it was just beginning. And when we get to Campbell's generation, you really see uh, anthropology saying, hey, hey, wait a second. If it's possible to have a grand unifying theory for mathematics, and it's possible to have a grand unifying theory for biology, why can't we have a grand unifying theory? And you have the emergence of these big theorists in anthropology. And um, it's not like it's all useless now. I mean, it's still useful stuff. And the, I'm talking real geniuses uh like uh, Claude Levi Strauss and Marcia Eliada, and an account, a lot. It's, it's quite a list of important thinkers and important data gatherers. And a lot of their ideas have simply been rebranded with boring, uh, you know, kind of peer review suitable names. Uh, they just put a label over the old label. But if you know the stuff, you look at it and go, Oh, this is identical to this. <laughs> not nothing new. But, you know, I'm not in a position to say anything. I'm not an academic. Uh, but uh, Campbell was in that group. Carl Jung had the collective unconscious. And Marcia Eliada had the sacred. 
and the profane and Claude Lévi-Strauss had the raw and the cooked and Joseph Campbell had the monomyth. And the monomyth is a rebranding of the collective unconscious is basically what it is. It's a unexplained black box that sort of metaphorically <laughs> describes a seemingly observable phenomenon that is not technically explainable. So the universality of certain motifs and images, iconography that goes back beyond uh, before before language as we know it, written language, before alphabets, before language uh, spread all across time and across the globe. You know, it's a mystery. Why? Why these why spirals and zigzags? They always represent the same thing or seem to represent the same thing or clustered in groups that are uh, associative and they're related to each other. You know, what's going on? We still don't know. Nobody knows this. So that that's what the monomyth was for. It, that was your explainer. You this is at least we can call it something. We're gonna call it the monomyth. You can see it. It's there. We're gonna call it something, and one day it, we're gonna crack that nut. I don't think there is literally a monomyth myself. At the same time, it's a it's a useful handle. You know, and if you have a big heavy box to pick up, hey, there's a handle on it. I'll <laughs> use the handle. I mean, that's what it is. It's just a handle. And as a handle, it works. I have no qualms about it as a handle. Uh, but that, that's really where uh, Campbell was rising up in. And, and to be up to date and to be competitive, if he's going to go forward with his interpretations, uh, he's getting in the ring with the big boys and gals. Uh, he, he had to have what he would you know, use one of his words, a whopper. He had to have a whopper of an idea, and this was already percolating in his head, and I will explain how I think it was percolating in his head, and how it affects the, uh, the hero's journey. So I'm going to give you a very brief Wikipedia-enabled overview of his life and career. Joseph Campbell was born in 1904 in White Plains, New York. Uh, as a kid, he became fascinated with Native American culture. And he read every book at the library on the subject, uh, which was mostly fiction, what we would call like pulp fiction or, you know, dime store fiction. <laughs> That's what he had. And, you know, I went through the same thing. I was interested in India as a kid. And what did I read? Rudyard Kipling. And I watched Sabu movies on television. This is what you do when you're a kid and you don't know nothing yet. Uh, he was, he read uh, all the kids section, they let him in the adult section. And that's how we became acquainted with anthropology. And then he started frequenting the Museum of Natural History and he became interested in dinosaurs and pre-human ancestors and evolution. Uh, he graduated from Columbia University in 1925 with a BA and then he got an MA in 1927 uh, for Arthurian scholarship, which he would later abandon so he could focus on uh, broad mythology or anthropology. Uh, he studied in Paris, and then he went to Germany to resume his studies at the University of Munich. This is 1927 to about 1930, and here's where he encountered the modernists. You know, people think of the modernists the early 20th century modernists as being reactionary and a break from the Romantic movement, not at all. That was the end of the original Romantic movement, which starts at the end of the 18th century with someone named James McPherson. And I will get into that in its own episode at one point. It's one of the most fascinating, uh, complex stories uh, regarding mythology that you'll, you'll ever hear. It's uh, great stuff. But um, the original Romantic movement was a folk movement. It was to reclaim the roots of culture and restore them, restore the connective tissue. Um, but that idea of plumbing down, uh, the, the modernists were plumbing down into the unconscious. And what were they coming up with? These fragmented forms. And I'll get into this in the next episode when I explain my interpretation of cosmogony and cosmology. But if you go back in time... No, a lot a lot is missing so all we have are fragments and this seems very abstract and ultra modern to us 
But uh, you look at Picasso and you look at uh, James Joyce's stream of consciousness uh, and, and uh, you know, the new the jazz music that was happening, a modern comp- composition like Schoenberg and all this sort of thing. It's really digging down into the unconscious. It's not, it's not futuristic. It's going into the past and getting into a kind of primitive state of mind. And I, I think this is what excited him. That's my interpretation, but I don't think it was novelty. I think uh, Campbell felt that part of his brain being tickled and the deep, dark underbelly. Uh, and this is where he encountered psychology and Freud and Jung, and he started to put all these things together, art and society and biology and psychology. Uh, how do you put all this together? During the Great uh, Depression, he headed up to um, Woodstock, New York. Good place for that. Uh, he had no job. He had no money. And he just sat around and read. He he really put himself through a kind of DIY postgraduate and doctorate course. And he emerged a Titanic scholar. Um, his, his focus must have been extraordinary. Uh, in 1934, he was offered and accepted a position in the literature department at Sarah Lawrence College, uh, a post that he would retain for 38 years. In 1940, uh, he was introduced to Eastern thought through a Swami who was working with an Indologist, Heinrich Zimmer. Uh, Zimmer, you got to read Zimmer. If you, if you do Campbell, even if you don't do Campbell, if you're interested in India and you're interested in this subject, Heinrich Zimmer was a genius. What a treasure. Completely unknown now and forgotten, but a great scholar and an incredible writer. Zimmer introduced Campbell to a member of the editorial board of the Bollingen Foundation, which published the works of Carl Jung. And uh, eventually the idea came up in... Uh, in the 40s, mid 40s, for Campbell to do a book. And here we go, smoking gun time, kids. Uh, as Campbell tells the story, uh, his uh, wife was away, and uh, he was invited to have lunch uh, with an editor, and uh, or dinner, I forget, doesn't matter, a meal. And the editor said, we'd like you to write a book about myth for us. And Campbell, according to him, said, what well, kind of a book? And they said something like bullfinches, or he, or they described it to him, and he said, "You mean like bullfinch?" And uh, you know, bullfinch, he's uh, in every uh, discount bin and every chain bookstore uh, in the English-speaking world. Uh, the age of fable, the age of myth. He's a classic, uh, you know, the 19th century uh, Victorian or Edwardian. He would uh, retell the great old tales and uh, simplify them, edit them, clean them up. Uh, beautiful illustrations. Uh, there were three volumes. And uh, the editor says, yeah, just like that. And Campbell said, uh, I would not touch it with a 10-foot pole. And the editor said, oh, well, what kind of book do you want to write? And Campbell explained the hero, as he called it, the uh, hero's journey concept. And the editor said, oh, like a self-help book? And Campbell said, exactly, or something along those lines, precisely. Uh, that, I think, is the core and the heart of his work, uh, a kind of evangelical work on behalf of uh, this, I, this concept of enlightenment he had, of universal enlightenment, a way that any person could make their life at least tolerable, if not infinitely better. Uh, I think that was really at the heart of what he did. And mythology was a vehicle. It was a vehicle for him. Uh, he had other vehicles, bi- biological science, psychology, the arts. Uh, mythology was just one uh, of the vehicles that he used to deliver this synthetic, syn- syncretic, med- psychological medicine to people. Um, and then, of course, this would have pleased him greatly to, to think of himself as a medicine man or a shaman. And I, I think he was. And I think he was successful. Yeah, I think his works are fantastic. But I do not think there is a hero's journey. 
Now, as I said, once you get past the book and you get into the stuff, you are confronted with the fact that it ain't there. What has he done? He's taken a story from here and then a story from 500,000 years later, you know, after this portion of the society had been conquered and converted to another religion and speaking another language. And, and he cut parts out of both versions and he's interwoven them together and he's moved things around and he's framed it and he's added things. And so, whoa, whoa, wait a second. What's going on here? At first you think, wait, I can't trust this guy. Can I trust this guy? Uh, and, then, and then over time, you come to appreciate that he was a storyteller. He was a bard. He was a healer. And this is what they do. But uh, the structure, why it, it, you know, it, theoretically, it should be there. You, you recognize the archetypes. You recognize the motifs. But everything seems it's in the wrong order. It's not in the right order. And sometimes things are doing things they shouldn't be doing and indicating things they shouldn't be indicating. Well, this is because he took all of the cultural context out. Why did he take all of the cultural context out? Well, in order to have the monomyth, he had to neutralize specific local, regional, cultural context. If you include that, they're no longer universal. But they aren't. They're not universal. They have universal elements, but they're not universal. But he had to make them universal. So he, I have a beautiful quote here, and then I'm going to go on to three of his pet words, okay, to describe what we would think of as indispensable anthropological detail. But uh, this quote's beautiful. All myths are the creative products of the human psyche. That artists are a culture's myth makers, and that mythologies are creative manifestation of humankind's universal need to explain psychological, social, cosmological, and spiritual realities. Now, I'm not going to argue with that. Now, point by point, that's all true. That's all true, and, and it's easy to find uh, evidence to indicate that it is true. The, the, the point of these uh, beautifully phrased uh, quotes that he came up with was to kind of get you to not think in terms of specific cultures. So he would he would use the word parochial. So if someone brought it up, he'd go, oh, 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 that's, you know, it's a parochial localized interpretation. Uh, so you look up parochial and uh, you see, oh, we're relating to a church or parish. OK, so this he would say, well, that, you know, the local priests whoever they were, when this story was, was thought up. Uh, you know, it was their interpretation, but they were limited. They'd never been anywhere. They didn't know anything. Uh, they may have had profound insight into, you know, the interior spiritual experience, but uh, they didn't know anything about the world. So it's parochial. You know, we also get confined or restricted as if within the borders of a parish. Limited in range or scope as to a narrow area or region. And he loved this word. And it was, it was his way of so get, distancing you from the specific context. You know, that's so parochial. You know, you were big. We're talking about the whole species, the unity of this, the psychological unity of the human species. It's much bigger than this, you know, these, uh, 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 anthropologists who, who are only interested in all this local stuff. Uh, provincial, another word he loved, and we find a person or, of local or restricted interests or outlook. Again, the same point. Local, another word he loved, of relating to or characteristic of a particular place. Not general or widespread primarily serving the needs of a particular limited district. Now, I, I chose those definitions on purpose because of the way they were worded. And uh, that, that's really the gist of what he was on about. Yes, they spring up and then they're imprinted. They're sure corrupted. The, uni the underlying universal psychological narrative is corrupted by the local stuff. And you, you have to sort of 
uh, scrape away that dross, that rust, you know, and you have to get at the, the, be the beautiful thing that's been covered up by it. Um, I do not agree with this. I vehemently disagree. And uh, in this episode, I'm going to attempt to persuade you that the hero's journey is nothing more than unavoidable basic story structure and can be applied to almost anything. And I'm also hoping to impress upon you the importance of the local context, how the stories make no sense when you take them out of the local context. Once you get past the universal human experience, they just stop making sense, and you have to understand as far as you can what they actually mean. And uh, they don't mean what you think they mean. They don't mean that in the Campbellian sense. And, and sometimes they mean things that we now think are terrible. They're socially unacceptable. They're, it's not, so, not something you would subscribe to, but tough luck, that's what the story means. If you follow this thought through and you just start stripping everything away, um, eventually what, what you're left, is, left with is a template that you fit everything to. This is the opposite of science. This is the opposite of observing a pattern that occurs in nature. You're imposing this pattern on nature. Uh, so I'm going to get right into that. And uh, I'll ex after that, I'll explain how this becomes what I call mythology bingo. So I'm going to let's rip through your basic generic version of interpretation of Campbell's hero's journey. And with, with each big step, I'll ask simple questions, and you just answer honestly. Uh, I think most people who listen to this will end up agreeing with me. Okay, so first thing we have to do is differentiate story from fiction. This is where people get confused. Fiction is a relatively recent phenomenon. You can do anything in fiction now. For about a hundred years or more, uh, in there, uh, even going back, there are people who are already trailblazing the genre of prose fiction, like um, Rabelais in the 16th century, and uh, Jonathan Swift, and Tolstoy, and Dostoevsky. Uh, and then it was, you know, once people got used to the novel or the play, not, not as repertory, but as something contemporary, and you bring in cinema, uh, everything changes. And now a story, story can be anything. You can start in the middle, start at the end, do it backwards, do it all out of time, interweaving like um, uh, Christopher Nolan and uh, Quentin Tarantino do that. You know, this is, it's postmodernism or whatever. Who cares? <laughs> the point is, a story is not fiction. You can write a novel, make a play, make a movie, do a comic book, whatever, that has events, it has characters, it has subtext. You don't ever have to have a story. You can be a novelist like Jonathan Franzen, who doesn't have stories. His books are just things that happen to characters. Whatever it is that he thinks it is important to talk about, they don't have stories. The story is the essence of the narrative. In the simplest terms, it's the arc of the protagonist. And that has to be there. And for ages upon ages, stories were received orally from a storyteller. Uh, this, once you get into civilization, this was somebody's bread and butter. And... Uh, you know, orally told stories have a very different quality from fiction and drama. They have, uh, they have melody and rhythm. You recognize it immediately when you're listening to a great storyteller. And you know these are techniques that are as old as the hills. And we have no idea how old these techniques are of grabbing the audience's attention, engaging them emotionally, and holding their attention. 
there are repeated phrases. Uh, there, there's all these elements to, to oral storytelling that are incredibly important. You have casual storytelling, like I've been doing. I told you how I found Joseph Campbell. I told you a little about it, about his life. And then you have, you know, more formal storytelling, uh, like Campbell did, where he'd get up in front of an audience and say, "This is what happened to Osiris," and he had his own version of it. And you know, it's, he had his own style. And it was not like something you would see written. He didn't, re he didn't repeat what he had written verbatim in front of people or for an interview. So you have to separate, stop thinking about fiction for a moment. Forget about Hollywood. Forget about television. Forget about novels. Forget about science fiction and fantasy epics with a lot of ornate world building that we say, oh, that's the mythology. I'm going to get into that in major technical surgical detail uh in the in the next episode and, and continue with that separating all these things but for the moment for forget fiction we're talking about story the storyteller's goal is to hold the audience's attention what can they relate to what is the best order in which they for things to happen to unfold what works? And I'm sure there's a biological basis for this. I'm sure there's a long process of enculturation that, that's involved in this. But uh, it's true. It's just true. And uh, you know the difference when, when a story sucks. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to mention any uh, particular Star Wars movies that came out recently by name. But uh, you know when... Uh, you've been robbed and you go, that's not how the story goes. I don't know how it's supposed to go, but I know how it's supposed to go. And that's not it. That's what I'm talking about. The essence, the story, all the other stuff belongs to various literary genres and they don't even have to have a story. We're just concerned with the story. According to Campbell, we have to begin in the ordinary world, but wait, what ordinary world? Well, it's whatever constitutes the day-to-day -day existence for the hero. Well, talk about beginning with a movable goalpost. I mean, it could be a god, emperor, magician. You know, it doesn't matter. It's you begin in the ordinary world. And what is this in relation to basic storytelling structure? Well, you have to know something about the, the protagonist. To get emotionally engaged... You have to know something about them. So things have to be relatively stable, no matter how outrageous the situation is, how out of the ordinary for the audience. There has to be some stability. And this is simple. You have to have some uh, foundation to build your narrative on. So, uh, yeah, that's basic storytelling structure. You try and think of a way of telling Without all, without being able to have recourse to the everything that the language can do on the page now, and everything a reader will tolerate in terms of out, out, you know, outrageous technique. Forget about that. Forget about what you can do on stage with lighting and and music and and set design. Forget about what you can do with special effects and editing and music and voiceover. Just in telling a story, you, you can't begin w w with a, a crazy litany of extraneous details <laughs> that's, so, that's so insanely complicated that nobody can follow it. So you can't, you can't even tell a story without having some foundation, some kind of stability to introduce your hero, your protagonist. I'm taking, you know, I take that away. There's no, there's no mysterious external force dictating that this happens. You know, obviously there are neurological and biological and long, well-worn cultural reasons why this is the norm, but it is the norm. Now, not, I would say nothing special there. Again, we get into what I call mythology bingo. You can apply it to anything. Is everything a, the hero's journey? Every, every narrative? By the time I get done, I'll show you. You can apply this to a television commercial if you want. So then they experience the call to adventure. 
well, what are they just going to stay there? Everything was good, and <laughs> and <laughs> or everything was terrible in the hero's world, and uh, they decided to uh, just stay in bed. The end. Done. Have a good evening. Thank you for coming. Good night. Well, obviously not. Now you have the audience's attention. This is what you wanted. You have to hold their attention. So whether the situation is bad or the situation is good, it, something has to happen. Either the bad has to be addressed or this utopia no one experiences, no one, in which your whole mind is screaming, well, that's not life. I don't like this person, this, this hero. They have everything I don't have. And uh, they don't care about the rest of the world. They don't even care about en enough about themselves to get out of bed. So obviously you got to get them out of bed, so to speak. Something's got to happen. You need a catalyst. You know, something's got to happen or there is no story. It's as simple as that. You set it up, you get the ball rolling. So what, what call do it? What is this? You know, I, I'm not going to go into enormous detail. I don't have the book in front of me. I did that on purpose or else this would be hours and hours long if I had references and citations. I'm just ripping through it. But seriously, you're telling a story. This is what you do. You set the stage and something unusual is going to happen. Now, you're usually the protagonist in a story you tell. And this is usually how you set it up. I was going about my own business. It was an ordinary day. And then this idiot cut me off. Next thing I know, I'm uh, swerving off the road toward a fire hydrant, you know? Now, maybe it didn't exactly happen that way. Maybe you had cranked the radio up and uh, you were uh, distracted and you weren't paying attention and you were speeding. Uh, you know, you're going to take all that out. You know, what's important is... Uh, you, you were taken out of your normal course. And it, it, this is the promise that the end of the story will make sense and be satisfying. This is where you're making the promise at this stage in the story to the audience. It's, gonna be, it's not going to be stupid or, or pointless. It's going to mean something. Now, you know, they, they call it an adventure. Well, this could be anything, absolutely anything. That's why I call this mythology bingo. And you go on YouTube and everything from what was the um, Pretty Woman, the movie uh, about the prostitute. I mean, anything from that to horror movies. Yeah, I mean, you could just apply this to anything. Absolutely anything. And, you know, that proves it. They're all the same story. Well, no, and I'll get into that, why they're not all the same story. Of course, you're getting into 10th generation here of following that one book. Of course, after a time, everything's going to start to resemble the theory. This is a no-brainer to me. Well, you know, <laughs> let's get back to uh, the call to adventure. Well, you know, something's going to happen, so it happens. And the hero said, yes, I'll go. That's it. <laughs> no drama. No suspense. I mean, you're going to, you're, again, you're just going to lose the audience here. I mean, what can you think of a good story that goes this way? Things were great. The hero just decided to stay in bed. Things were terrible. The hero decided, eh, sooner or later, things will get better. There's nothing to do. No, okay? That catalyst happens, okay? The house burns down, and they, they have to set out on a journey. So we don't know this person yet. How do we know we can trust this hero? How do we know we like this hero? Well, there has to be something there for us to connect with. So we would be in shock. We're in shock when something catalytic happens in our life. And our first impulse is naturally to deny that. And I'll get into why this is important later. But our first impulse is to deny that something happened. We're not ready. We're not prepared. We're Bilbo Baggins. We don't, we don't have any pocket handkerchiefs. We're not ready for this. So you're, you, this is the, the audience's willing suspension of disbelief. I mean, it's a very delicate balance. So you can have you know, one day after living with a tyrannical dictator who murdered his family for no reason, the hero thought, I might as well take care of this. I'm going to uh, uh, embark on a quest. <laughs> okay, this what? Huh? 
This is, does, does it, life doesn't work that way. So stories don't work that way. I'll get into this. You're probably already putting it together yourself. But uh, this is no kind of you know, hidden, uh, uh, in incomprehensible, mysterious, underlying structure that we can never know anything about. This is Storytelling 101. They're, you're going to spend a lot of time with the protagonist. It's better if you if they're at least interesting that you can relate to them or that you like them. There are many different ways you can play this. You know, the denial could be for good reason. This is simply acknowledging simple, you know, basic human psychology. They could say, oh, well, I have a wife and kids and a full time job. I can't go to Zimbabwe. Uh, fight in the revolution or you know <laughs> feed feed the starving and the poor and then so somebody has to has to convince them well you know everyone here will be okay they're all taken care of and you're the only person who can do this that's one way of dealing with it narratively you know another way is they're just packed up and sent on their way there is no choice you know the family's all dead they're all killed the Whole village is killed. The city is blown up. The planet is blown up. Endless variations of this. You know, they're just thrust. And they're catapulted into the narrative. However you do it, you can't just stay there because it's going to get boring. It's like, how much of this is going to go on before we get into the story? I want, I want you know, the protagonist has to have people to talk to. Uh, they're, 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 we want a change of scene, we want events, we want suspense, maybe a little romance, you know, and the, the way the situation is set up, you know, good luck that there's going to be a joke in here. These are all the things that we expect from a good story shaped by untold generations of talented storytellers who created this whole paradigm. I believe by measuring the level of interest of the audience. That's because I've done a lot of performing on stage. And I know what happened. I've also studied this, you know, scholastically. I've studied this technically, uh, oral tradition and narratology and all this stuff. And I think this is a very basic paradigm. Where did we get this structure from? This sense, not the structure, but the sense of how a story goes. It came from the audience. And it has to do with attention span, relatability. This is what it boils down to. This is your basic story structure. So... You know, now they have to cross a threshold. Well, no, duh. <laughs> Again, boring story nobody cares about. I can fix this from my living room. I don't ever have to go anywhere. Well, what a disappointment. And again, all of these things are valid. You can, there are comedies that are structured that way. There are horror stories that are structured that way. And there are murder mysteries that are structured that way. Constructed that way, they never leave the house that the murder happens in. But you still need all these other elements. There, you know, there are a million ways of doing, of packaging this. That's why it's so malleable that literature now can take any form. And the audience became more sophisticated. The tools became more dynamic and more sophisticated. Abstraction of thought, the speed of our ability to process abstractions has increased because of technology. The elements stay the same, but they, they don't even, they don't, as you'll see, they don't need to be in the same order. Because if, when you confront what can be found of these oldest written versions, is really all we have to go on, oldest written versions, uh, frequently, you know, the, the, the story will start, it'll stop, it'll go here, or it'll go there, or the things are, things are in the wrong, they're in the wrong sequence, but they're there. And that's because the audience was different. And there really, there really wasn't any culture for reading what was written. It was for the elite. There wasn't any market. There weren't any controls on that. And for very important cultural reasons, there would be intermediary steps and things that don't fit this paradigm. But just in terms of telling a gripping story, this is what I'm saying is you, you can find this if you want, but what you're finding is a general sense of how a story goes based on very simple precepts like attention span, emotional engagement, attention holding, and satisfaction. 
So they have to cross a threshold. Well, of course, you go from A to B, you got to cross a threshold. And then it, 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 there's the belly of the whale or the labyrinth or whatever. Of course, you just, you, you get out of the gates, you know, and he talks about like supernatural aid. You know, there's something, somebody comes, comes in and uh, they give you information and, you know, this, and this prepares you for the next stage. And well, yeah, you've had a big opening. You're going to exhaust the audience. And this does work in other for in media forms, like a movie. If you have a 30 minute opening action sequence, it's got to slow down. At some point, is it you know? And uh, frequently, this is true of the most ancient stories that we have written down. When you go, when you put all everything that was written all together in one place, you'll end up with volumes, you know. And you, they may open with a battle that that goes on and on and on. It's like Jesus, just get to the story already, you know. Begin with a bang, engage the audience. Get the ball rolling, give them a chance to rest, relax, settle in, maintain their engagement. Then before it gets more you know, boring again, bam, you got to have something to, to build suspense. You can say, well, that's the belly of the well. That's the trial. This is the beginning of the whole process of making the hero the hero. This is holding the audience's attention. You know, too much information, not enough information, too much action. Not enough action, repetition. These aren't good ways of holding the audience's attention. So naturally, after a little bit of a slow part where you can put in some important um, plot exposition and character development, you're off to the races again. Something's got to happen. And it's got to be more intense than what happened at the beginning of the story or it's anticlimactic. And you may not like this hero. It's not like they're, you know, it was it was tougher at the beginning. Now they're just waltzing. They're just waltzing through the story. And you got to up the stakes. This is just basic storytelling. you got to up the stakes at this point. You know, they have many trials. And there will be temptations. Well, what the hell else are you going to do to fill out the story and develop the character? And you tell me. And what else is going to go in the middle? Nothing. Just have a big banquet. Go to a theme park. Get stuck in traffic. Something's got to happen. Sometimes you'll have the characters imprisoned. You know, you can't let that go on too long. That's boring. And you still want to believe that they can fix things. And they have to escape. But it, what else are you going to put in the middle? This is all, there's no space for it in the beginning, and you don't know any of these people. You can't begin with, you know, a, a grand love story. You have to introduce that character. You can begin with a love story and it all goes wrong. Maybe they're separated. Maybe they have to embark on a journey together. But you, you, can't, you can't, can't just have them there at the finish line in the beginning. And most stories aren't concerned with that right at the beginning. That's at the end. It's always at the end. The resolution in the middle is the trial to get there. And why? Because of a mysterious monomythological structure that can never be... No! I will Believe me, I will tie all this up at the end. <laughs> this is just basic storytelling. Where the hell else does it go? It, of course it goes there. You stuff it all in the middle. Why? Because you, the audience is engaged. If you do it right, you got them straight till the end. They're not going anywhere. And yeah, they'll put up with stuff. They'll put up with stuff in the middle. And very few people walk, walk away from a story and say, my favorite part was the middle. You know, what you remember is the ending. And people will forgive really, you know, sloppy middles. Like, yeah, they stuffed a lot of exposition. They sort of took a nap there. And there are some unmotivated action scenes. And, uh, yeah, I guess they were just trying to keep us interested. Well, yes, that is exactly what they were doing. Because most stories are, can be told in 10 minutes. You know? They we were stretching them out to three hours. Thousand pages. Uh, because it's technologically and market possible to do these things.
and these would, would have been considered epics beyond the grasp of the average writer in the past, and now it's a matter of course. Entire season of a television series, you know, 22 hours of narrative. Um, but uh, in terms of just the pure story, you know, it should be able to be summed up very quickly. It shouldn't take forever to tell the basic story. You can sum up the entire, you know, New Testament in a couple of minutes. You can sum up the Iliad or the Odyssey in a couple of minutes. And there are plenty of YouTube videos that do this. And if you really know the story, you got to admit, yeah, that was the story. Yeah. You know, just missing all the detail, that, that is the essence of the story. And what you're seeing are the high points that keep the audience from walking away. So you have trials, according to Campbell. And of course, you have the male and female, you know, masculine and feminine dynamic. You're going to get a love story, probably. Many different ways you can you can end that. And now you're getting toward the end, and he talks about atonement, atonement with the Father. There are many ways of interpreting that. But uh, really, just this just falls into whatever your cultural context, is our hero an asshole or not? <laughs> because you get this doubt when you're getting towards the end of a story, and, and you're not really, do I really like this person? Do I really relate to this person? And the storyteller has to really sell it towards the end. There has to be a moment where they show they represent the highest ideals uh, of human capacity. What is the highest? And the, the, there has to be some sort of forgiveness, atonement, and this is universal. And I, I think it's universal for a much simpler reason. You start to invest, and you're imagining it from the point of view of the protagonist. And you want to be, you want that person to be as much like you as possible. Uh, why this happens, we do not know. And I talk about this in the next episode. I call this the riddle of Hecuba, which is a reference to Hamlet. I'll get into that. But what, for whatever reason, you enter into them, and now they're you, and you're them. And uh, you need a reassurance that you're a good person because you've been identifying with this person. And again, just recently, there was a television series and they took a character to a dark place. And a lot of the audience was very disappointed. It was right before the ending and people were frustrated. That's not how the story goes because they were identifying with her. If you watched Game of Thrones, not my thing, but I follow follow it. It's so popular, you can't avoid it. You know, again, not to get all the rest of it, the fiction of it, confused with story, but just the arc, the essence, the arc of that protagonist. You wanted that, re people were naming their children after this character. You want to identify with them. And that there's no mysterious reason for that, because if they go off the rails, then you think, oh, I was rooting for them. <laughs> what does that say about me? It's very simple. And a good storyteller, a good storyteller understands this. A great storyteller, a sophisticated storyteller can take you anywhere and handle the characters and the audience in such a way that it never feels like a violation. That's a great storyteller. That's a master. We don't have masters now. We have hopeless amateurs who have read The Hero with a Thousand Faces too many damn times and don't know what they're doing. But anyway, I digress. What else is going to happen? Are you, are you really going to have <clears throat> the hero and the heroine? They're right near the climax. They're going to take on the bad guy. And for no good reason whatsoever, he strangles her to death because he was jealous momentarily. What? <laughs> and, you know, you see this. And it, out of cultural context, a lot of old stories have things like this. And you go, whoa, what the hell? And you have to put in as much of the connective tissue as possible. And you, oh, this is what they're talking about. It's very culturally specific. And you can't universalize that. You have to understand it from the point of view. It's a good thing they took that person's heart out and ate it. Okay. You know, <laughs> but uh, that, that's why I don't. Don't get story and fiction confused as the same thing. 
and why I'm making this argument that you can't go universal with all of it or most of it doesn't make any sense after you, you do. But as for what you think you're seeing when you apply this supposed pattern that's underlying everything, I'm telling you, you're, of course you're not going to do that. You'll lose the audience. You've almost got them. It's time for fan service. All you want are cheers and roses thrown on the stage. You've sustained a long narrative and the audience is with you. What are you going to do? Ruin it? That's dumb. Again, this was their bread and butter. Uh, you, you didn't want the whole village chasing you out for ruining the story. They set the template. And it was the audience that sent the template. And it was very, very simple audience expectations that set the template. Not some mysterious biopsychological thing that we can't ever understand, for which there is no evidence, and which doesn't even work if you examine it closely. And this is my position, and I'm hoping to win some people over. Just stop and think. You know, then you, you have the, the uh, hero must win. It's the, the ultimate boon. It's the ultimate success. It's the world-winning success. It's apotheosis. They become the hero. Finally, the hero is born. Again, we're going to kill them off then? Not this. This doesn't happen. But you have to understand, in old, old stories, thousands of years old, it meant something specific. And we don't have those meanings now for a general audience. And it would be disastrous. Could you imagine, like, you know, the Matrix, if at the end Neo was killed. At the tippy end, the agents just killed him in the, the hallway of the apartment building. The end! But there are other heroes. The story goes on. Uh, no. No, we're not doing that. The audience doesn't like it. We're winning. And this is very simple. Close the circle. At that point, you bring it to a climax. You also have, how long can you sustain attention? It has a limit. It has a limitation. And you know when you're getting there. All right, this is going long. Going to cut stuff out. <laughs> going to get there. We don't need this, this, that, and the other. And you get your climax. Mm -hmm. Again, this is just basic storytelling. Then he has, you know, there's more. I'm gonna, not going to get into all. There's so many parts to this. You, you get uh, to the, the point where the, you know, the hero has accrued all this stuff and they have to spread it. They have to bring it back, bring it home, take it home. We go all the way back from, to where we started with gifts for everybody. They're becoming the hero. Their heroism, their journey, these stages have shaped them and now they have something profound is it you know they have the dragon's gold they have the wisdom of the gods they have the elixir of life whatever and they're gonna they're gonna bring it to the common person again who wants to hear and uh then the uh knight uh set up an apartment in the in the after he got rid of the dragon's carcass and uh he just kept all the gold to himself and he wasted most of it on gabbling and whores <laughs> okay, you don't want to hear that. This is the last shit test. I've invested so much. The story's not over yet. Fingers crossed. Please don't let this person, this fictitious person I'm identifying with, screw it up. This is the last chance the storyteller has to tell you, you, you have good taste in liking my hero. Because if you don't, you're telling them you're an idiot for liking my hero. And the audience doesn't like that. Okay? Only weirdos like that. Who likes that from a basic story? I'm not talking about some challenging Ingmar Bergman, you know, it's a, a abstract literary novel, modernist play. No! I just thought the story in its essence, basic, time-worn stories like a hero story. You don't want that to happen. You're going to hate it. And it, it, This came about from people probably throwing vegetables and <laughs> rocks at storytellers who tried to change it. No, no, no. We don't like that. You had us and then you screwed it up. 
You know, there better be a good explanation. Well, there is. Here's the moral. Okay. You know, if that fits morally with the, the culture, then it's okay. If it doesn't make any sense in any context, it's not okay. And I'm sure there were rotten storytellers who got ran out of town, you know? And this is how we ended up with our idea of what makes a good story. Because those were the first things written down. And then they, you know, people looked at it and said, it's nice to have this written down, but it's sloppy. It's baggy. It's uh, unfocused. Like, you know, and you get literature out of that. And this could be written in a much higher language. I'm a poet. Wait a second. I can, I can fix this myself. You have very crude versions. And then a thousand years later, you have Ferdusi, Shaname. Extraordinary heights of poetry, you know, and then that that becomes fiction and drama, and and that becomes very dynamic, and we forget what the story is. We can't locate the story and all that. We're too distracted by the technique and the structure and the form. But some things never change, and nobody wants the the hero to be an asshole. It's as simple as that. You tell me how to break that rule. I don't think Campbell has a case here. What else is going to happen, dude? Nothing else is going to happen. You have the audience. It's time to tuck them in and put them to sleep with a smile on their face. And he has all these stages, you know. And when you, when you, get, when you pass back over the initial threshold and you get back to the world that you came from, you're another master of many worlds. Master of two worlds, the outer world and the inner world. And that's what the story is about. And you know what? That's what the stories were about. But they didn't have a structure. They're all over the place. This is the very first thing you notice. Here's what I think happened. I'll iron this out. Campbell noticed two things. One... He became aware of the utility of these narratives and certain psychological elements that are universal to the species. He, he also became aware that the ancients were aware of this. And all the way through time, all the storytellers, to some degree, were conscious of this. And shaping it in a certain way that pleased the audience and to deliver a didactic religious message or a socially reinforcing message, or a crowd-pleasing story, you get this basic form emerging. Even though they're just, they're motifs. You can put them in a blender. That's why I said the postmodern and the primitive resemble each other on the surface. That fragmentation of thought. And I'll get into this in detail in the next episode. I think Campbell saw the hero's journey in life. And look at his life story. It is the hero's journey. Everything that happens in the hero's journey happened to him. He was thrown out, thrust out into the world. He had the call to adventure. He, that was his interest in Native American culture. It was out of the norm. He had to leave the safety of the norm. And this goes through his whole life. He was beset by... Problems, the, the, the Great Depression, this, that, the other, setback, setback. But he followed his bliss, and it opened a door, and then he was able to continue learning, and he became the teacher. And he brought the, the, his, the gift of his knowledge, his acquired wisdom, the, the accumulated wisdom of the whole species. And he just, you know, he burned away all the excess and got it to its essence and passed it. He's the hero. You know, and so are you. And so am I. But the thing is, without a kind of a structure for it, you're back to, it's basically Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man, which is a great piece of poetry, but tell me something I don't already know about life. I think when he was offered the book, and through to, already through teaching the classes, uh, he had a sense of how he can make something of that. That idea that our life is an heroic journey. How we are like Perseus. And we are like King Arthur. And we are like 
all of these great heroes. I think that was what was most important to him. It had to have been, because he was well aware of the fact that what he was doing was not ever going to be taken seriously, technically, by the Academy. And his way of dealing with that was to say, they're all wrong. I think it was necessary for him to reach that place of power that he operated from, that he could change lives, and he did change lives, and he still changes lives. That's an extraordinary thing. But in order to do it, he had to do all this stuff with the source material. Had to mix, match, edit, change, resequence, reframe, take it out of its original context. They're his stories. They're beautiful stories. They're stories about life. Not all of them are stories about life in that direct way. Of course, all stories contain elements of life. All stories, no matter how abstract, will have parts that w which we can identify as coming from universal life experience. Of course, it's all there. It's not all there in a pre-cooked package waiting to be discovered. You just get your your, your little uh, brush and, and your trowel and you dust it off like an archaeologist and you reveal it. Uh, it, it as soon as you go to the stories that he used as examples, you'll, you see immediately the, the underlying structure isn't there. The motifs are there. The archetypes are there. The best way to tell them is the way that I just described that he described. But it's misleading to cut everything out. And, you know, why is it so important to put everything back in? No matter how fragmented our society becomes, global society, no matter how much of a melting pot, no matter how much is lost, you are still living in a context. You're in a context. And they might be some sort of mutant, even unhealthy, postmodern context, but it's a context. And there are plenty of shards of tradition shooting throughout your life, even if you're the most culturally bereft, empirical thinking, uh, scientific atheist. <laughs> Believe me, your life is shot through with tradition. You don't realize how much tradition you're carrying around making use of, engaging in, and being exposed to. But it doesn't matter. Context is context. And you have to learn how to make sense of your context. Or you get into this opposite paradigm where you try and make the world fit a template. And that is unhealthy. And most adherents to Campbell eventually discover, you know, you have to get past the teacher. You still honor the teacher respect the teacher, you owe the teacher, you acknowledge that, but they ha you have to get past him. And he invites you to get past him. So he's just going to make you tough enough to handle certain things. And then he trusts that you're going to go on your own. Maybe in person he would have disagreed with you if you told him, there's no hero's journey. And he'd say, you prove to me not. And then you go back and forth. But still, he was a mature adult. You know, <laughs> I'm sure he had differences with many other scholars and anthropologists and mythographers and so on. He, he, tr he trusted you to get past him. And if you read past that, even if you just read that book carefully many times, he's baiting you. He's inviting you to challenge him and get past him. He doesn't want you to just stay there, believing what he wrote down. But I think in his mind, for some people, that's as much as they could do. And it was better than the alternative of nothing of this sort in their life. But he trusted that there would be the others who would be curious enough to go past it. So the hero's journey is a beautiful description of the life cycle, the journey through life. And I think that's what was most important to him. It is not a pre-existing mysterious structure that underlies all myths. And in the next episode, I'm going to get into that damned word, myth, and take it apart. And we're really going to talk about what is a myth and what isn't a myth. I'm just using it generally in this episode because you don't know me. I don't know you. I'm covering a lot of topics. This is a very long introductory episode. But this is something that cannot be found or proven. It doesn't stand up to scrutiny.
And it's much easier to explain it as this is the best way to hold audience attention. It's basic storytelling. And now go look at some television commercials that have a little story. And you can say, oh, yeah, there's the Hosvinnies lounging by the pool, but uh, they have this old clunker of a car and everybody wants to go to the beach. And then his, his wife uh, gets him up out of the, the out of the backyard and they pile into the old uh, station wagon. It's spitting out dust, <clears throat> making noise, and then it stops and they're all unhappy. But uh, there, there's someone uh, on the side of the road, you know, dressed as a clown with a sign for Manny's uh, used car lot, which is right up the road. And uh, they very serendipitous. And uh, they 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 go and they 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 have to find they find the car they've been looking for, and that he trades it in. And now they all go to the beach happily together. And now his life, his wife is in love with him again, and the kids love him, and they're driving a shiny new used car. And you know what do you have? You have the call to adventure, the denial, the trials. <laughs> supernatural aid in the belly of the beast and they're stranded on the side of the road you know you know the final the atonement you know everybody forgives him for being a cheap jerk because now he's going to trade the old car in for a new one I mean, you, it's mythology bingo you can do it with anything and that's to me the point at which it becomes meaningless and pointless and i just get tired of these endless videos and documentaries and books and blog articles, uh, uh, they just get over it, and you have to get over it. So it's good to use for your life, but you're not going to understand these kinds of stories that way because you're imposing a structure on them, a structure that is not there. I do not believe exists. But do read Campbell. <laughs> Listen to Campbell. I love him. I owe him so much. And his books are still a joy to me. And I'm still learning from them because he, he lived so much longer than me and a much fuller life, I think, in many ways. Uh, so I still have things to learn from him. And uh, I would suggest move on to the Masks of God. It's the best next step from Hero. And it takes you much farther and it opens it up. Uh, it's, a, it's a great step. But that's Campbell and the Hero's Journey. And I had to... Whoosh, Get that out of the way, because most people you say myth, they say hero's journey. And I'm not, deal I'm not dealing with that. I'm coming from another angle. It's a lot more complicated and specific. And I want whoever listens to this to be on board with me. So now, now on to the next topic. The next name I hear all the time now on this subject after Campbell, it's Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. What are my views on Peterson? Listen on, and I shall reveal.